Um, hi everyone, my name is Brianna. I am the Acting Manager for Development and Investment at Create New South Wales. Um, and I have two incredible speakers with me today from the Multi Arts Board, um, as well as some um, Create New South Wales staff. Um, just to really start to give everyone an understanding of um, why Create New South Wales supports projects and why um, we have state funding to be able to support the arts and culture. It's important to understand the funding program objectives and really what they try and achieve. And for Create New South Wales, that's really looking at um, ensuring creative leadership and programming excellence across the state, that this is strong and continuous, that Create New South Wales is supporting projects that grow and increase arts and cultural activities, that engage with our communities, that provide social and cultural benefits and really looking at continuing um, New South Wales as a leader um, in arts and cultural presentation, development and governance that also ensures strong outcomes for artists and for our communities and audiences. So these are really um, the ideas or concepts that shape the rationale and reasoning of why Create New South Wales invests in arts and culture. Next slide, please. Um, so today, as I said, we have with us um, Mona Zayla and Peter Wood, very accomplished um, professionals who have an excellent history um, of working across art forms um, in, in the arts and cultural sector in New South Wales. Mona Zayla is currently the business coordinator at Campbelltown Arts Centre and previously the artistic and cultural programs manager at Information and Cultural Exchange or ICE Parramatta. Additionally, um, she's held administrative roles at Kasula Powerhouse and co-directed the nationally recognised Aram Film Festival. Peter Wood is the Executive Director at Arts Northern Rivers. He's previously held senior roles at Sydney Opera House, Company B, Bel Company B Belvoir, Bell Shakespeare and Historic Houses Trust New South Wales and has additional experience as a Marketing and Sponsorship Director at Melbourne International Comedy Festival. So you'll see there's already a diversity of art forms um, and experiences that our board members have. Next slide, please, Ivana. Um, just to understand also today is really about um, looking at the arts and cultural funding program, the current um, applications. As mentioned, they're due tomorrow at 5 p.m. I think it's important to say the time. Um, and there have been some changes between the previous rounds um, to now. One of those is that applicants are now able to identify if it's a development or presentation um, outcomes that they're looking at delivering for uh, the works. Also, um, there's financial requirements for project funding as well, which really are about ensuring that organisations um, and partnerships are viable and really being able to look at opportunities for funding. Um, there's also been changes to the impact area and you'll notice um, for annual funding, this provides um, the choice of three impacts, which is audience, um, art form and operational. And for projects, it's um, about looking at audience, art form or operational if you're an organisation. Um, and so really being quite clear under each of those impacts of what will be the successful outcomes of your project if they happen, if it is funded, but also to imagine if your project wasn't funded, what would the sector and what would our communities actually miss out on if that was the case. Also looking at support material, there aren't any limitations around support material um, in the number 
of letters or images that you can put up, but there is a recommendation around it being commensurate to the ask. Um, but I do stress that our art form board members are um, going through multiple applications. And so please um, take into account uh, that time and really what's gonna tell the best message. Next slide, please, Ivana. There we go. Um, so the funding that's available for individuals through Create New South Wales is project funding. There's also, we have a suite of creative leadership um, opportunities. Our Byron Writers Festival, for example, um, recently was completed and small project grants also for individuals and those are for up to five thousand dollars for organizations we have project funding and also annual organization funding and both those rounds as well as the project funding for individuals will be closing on wednesday next slide please avada so to to kick off, um, we really want this to be an open conversation where you um, as applicants, but also as arts and cultural community feel that you can ask both CREATE and our art form members um, questions that you might have around the application or around the process. Um, and if you do have those questions, I ask that you type them again into the chat box and I will make sure that I ask them of our extraordinary presenters. Just to start, one of the conversations that we have, is, um, questions that is often asked to create is what is the process of assessment? Um, so I might hand this now over to perhaps to Peter um, to start with about how um, the what is the process of assessment and how would you describe it, Peter? Okay, thanks for that. Um, I suppose from an operational point of view, um, the the process is once um, the uh, the um, applications have been through. Um, a, a process with Create New South Wales staff. They're then sent to the board members. Um, our process is obviously to go through each of those applications. And I guess from the outset, we should say that the, the Māori Arts and Festival Board is um, probably one of the, we receive one of the highest number of, of applications across, across all the boards uh, next to, I guess, visual arts as well. Um, so we go through those, um, through, the, through the applications, looking at them, um, I guess, through the lens of those um, areas of criteria in terms of merit, impact and um, uh, viability. Um, then against each of those, we um, provide a score. Um, and that score is reflective of how well the application has responded to, to, those, um, to those criteria. And um, then I guess, and I'm sure we'll have this conversation as we progress, there's, a, a, I suppose, more insight that we can offer in terms of what we're looking for underneath each of those criteria areas. But um, we then, um, when or pre-COVID, we, we came together physically to, um, to discuss um, the ranking of those um, applications and um, there's further opportunity within those within that face-to-face -face meeting with other board members to um, to dive deeper I guess into into the merits of the of the application um, any particular questions that we might have it's an opportunity for us to I guess um, to um, um, look a bit um, differently at, at, at some of the uh, some of the applications we've received and that's in response to other board members and their input and their insights and their experience as well so it's a that's a really important opportunity for us to um, to come together as a board um, the last time we came together obviously was in a um, in a uh, online environment which seemed to work <laughs> I was a bit worried about how that might work but um, I think we still managed to achieve the same sort of rigor in terms of being able to interrogate the uh, the applications that, that came across our um, across our, um, our our desks um, is there anything else I've, I've missed in that process um, no and I think um, just so everyone knows as we um, in the guidelines we all also publish uh, the process of assessment just uh, so that's really clear and I think it is important to note that as assessors um, you really do both of you 
take the time to go through and read each of them and to really respond um, to what's being said. And I guess that would lead to my next question um, for you, Mona, which is how um, do assessors really consider each application and what do you look at when you're reading? Thanks, Brianna. Um, well, just to kind of build on what Peter's already said, um, absolutely do take the time to kind of read the application and sometimes reread the application, particularly once you've gotten to the end and you're looking at the support material and, and going into the links provided um, for, for any support material, downloading budgets and so forth. Um, it's, for me personally, uh, looking at this, I, when I read the application I, and then have sift through some of the support material, I find myself needing to go back into the application and um, just to kind of get a, a really a, a deeper understanding of the project and the intention of the project. Um, you know, a particular areas for me I find really useful is uh, strong kind of support letters from any of the stakeholders that are um, mentioned in the uh, in the project submission, um, or if, if it's an annual program, um, and and just the kind of the 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 I suppose the quality of the support letter or the support material to back up the intention of the project and the you know the prediction of the impact. Um, I suppose other kind of uh, really important information for me is that the budget and the project make sense um, and that, that they speak, you know, that you can kind of see the kind of costs of a project reflected in the budget um, and that it relates to the project description, um, including in-kind contributions from partners because if, if a partnership is of value then it'd be great particularly with uh, other uh, creative people's time or administrators, producers. Um, I think it's really important that that's um, valued and, and you know, if possible, allocated in, in the budget so that there's a really kind of broad understanding of, um, you know, the size, the scale of the project, but also the, um, um, you know, how, I suppose it speaks to the viability for me, which, which I think is really important. Absolutely, and I think um, those expectations around support material and using all of that to really evidence your claims is a really significant and important part of an application. Um, so, Peter, for you, what um, is really important for assessing or what information do you think is really key to enable assessors to really understand um, what's being applied for? Um, I think one of the key things that really I look for is is a very clear vision um, attached to the project, like uh, so that I have a, a, a complete understanding of why this project or this activity or um, this program is um, is necessary. And I think that necessity is um, best articulated through the through the vision as well. So that you have um, an immediate kind of connection, I guess, um, with understanding what's trying to be achieved here. Um, so I think um, wrapped up in that is, um, in terms of the scope of the project, how achievable it is as well. Um, I'm looking for that, not in the sense that you know, um, just a case of you know, can you do it? It's uh, and and certainly there can be goals and there can be visions that that push you further. But I also want to have a kind of um, conviction that you know this this vision is achievable, and then that's supported through a whole heap of things that, that we've touched on just briefly. Things like you know support letters or partnerships that you're bringing to the table with the project as well. And um, partnerships is a big thing for me because a lot of my projects, especially in a regional context, rely on partnership development, development as as do you know a majority of projects. Um, and so I, I kind of really look for those. Um, 
uh, partnerships to see how it builds um, kind of robustness to the to the to the project. It's bringing other people to the table. So that's kind of like a key element also that I uh, the lens I guess I, I apply when I do my first read through. And as Muna said, we often go back and reread uh, to get a clearer understanding. Um, and I think the um, we touched on things like support materials. So it's really kind of important that the support material that you supply is, is really well considered, um, especially in terms of letters of support. It's really important that those letters reflect, um, they, they could reflect those partnerships and those letters are another opportunity to explain that vision as well. Um, your vision can be actually articulated well by a letter, a good letter of support, either from a partner or from an allied, you know, organisation or, or artist that you're working with. Um, thanks, Peter. And I think, Mona, you really also talked about viability. And with letters of support, um, how important do you think they are if you're working with communities or if you're working with um, a diversity of audiences and artists? Look, they're, they're absolutely, they're very important. I mean, that's the, and, and look, it, for me, I, I find, um, I, I've seen some really interesting kind of support material provided, not just letters, but sometimes like, for example, you know, an organisation working with um, children, um, how do you get there? And you've, you've kind of already, you've got the experience of working with these children, you know that it's had a major impact on these young people and their families, how do you gather that detail in a kind of, you know, short and sharp and creative way? And sometimes it's, you know, kids scribbling and, and just attach scribbling kind of, you know, their love for the project and how it's made them feel or a, a vox pop, a short, you know, short and sharp kind of, you know, video attach. I find that really engaging. It tells the story for me. Um, and, and, and it's not, you know, you're not kind of, reading something that's been written by an adult, particularly if you're engaging with young people or, you know, even if it's provided in multiple languages. So um, in the time that I was working on the Arab Film Festival, and I'll give you an example, because this is what, what I did for the project, at the, at the event, at any of the screenings, we would capture, have a video, um, you know, camera person kind of watching people come out and just saying, some amazing stuff, how they're feeling, how that particular film or panel was, you know, has made them think differently um, and just cutting that down and, and it, you can use it in so many different ways. So capturing the the uh, impact of, a, of any of the activities and capturing the, um, the thoughts and feelings of some of the participants, I think is of, of value and really like for, for me as an assessor, I find that, um, really powerful material. Thanks, Mona. I think that's great. Um, I want to ask a question around um, audience reach and development, but I guess to preface that, following this question, we'll also talk a little bit about, um, we'll ask about the changing times because we have to acknowledge COVID as well and the impact that that has had. Um, when you're reading applications and as assessors, um, how do applicants demonstrate audience reach and how might this have changed um, given um, the impact of COVID and now? Um, maybe Peter, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, sure. It's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, I think, you know, traditionally I've kind of viewed reach in terms of, you know, how engagement kind of is bundled up in, in, in with that. So how how the project engages an audience um, and, you know, the measurables are, you know, there are simple measurables attached to that in terms of attendance figures or number of people engaged with the project. But I guess in terms of like looking a bit broader than just bums on seats or actual numbers, um, uh, I try and, and, and find in applications um, at what level that sort of audience reach is taking place, whether it's through direct community consultation, um, is it through a workshop program, um, 
how uh, how you know how deep I guess is that is that engagement that is part of the project, which to me then also talks about reach and how far that that project or the proposal is reaching um, into into uh, the community. Um, in terms of layering, I guess a, a COVID filter over it, um, obviously it, it kind of brings in a whole heap of other considerations when looking at applications and, and naturally we, we are very, very mindful of, of that in the process and, and I would imagine that that's going to start being reflected in people's applications when they do address those criteria areas of, um, of reach and impact and merit because they're all going to be, you know, impacted by this, this um, current you know, world that we live in. So I think, you know, there obviously will be um, opportunities to explore that sort of online environment in terms of, you know, um, measuring that engagement in some ways makes it a little bit easier in terms of metrics of, of, of measuring, but, but then what sort of platforms would be appropriate for the project that you're proposing and, and one platform might not necessarily be as effective in terms of that reach as another so those sort of, I would be looking for those sort of considerations when addressing um, issues of, of reach in an application um, so yeah yeah thanks Peter Mona? um yeah I mean I, I kind of agree with Peter um, I think it's it is you know articulating the challenges um, uh, because of the because of our current situation, um, but also, you know, if if possible, and I know this is not possible in all communities and in all areas in terms of digital engagement, um, you know, in making the most of that, I'm not I'm not sure what else I can really add. I think, you know, being honest about the the challenges that we're currently facing and um, the organisations running projects and trying to engage with artists and communities um, is just, I suppose we need to think think a little bit outside the box. Um, and if the digital engagement is is not possible and not viable at this stage, um, then, you know, are there alternatives? Uh, you know, are we consulting community members to ask them what they think? Um, or is that in train? Is that in process? Sorry, I don't know if I've answered it, uh, Pippa's question, but um, I hope that's useful. And I think, thank you, Mona, I think you have. And I think the other part um, of that is also, it's really about um, not being afraid to acknowledge um, the changing landscape and the changing environment. And particularly for organisations, I think making that part of a risk management strategy, which the application forms um, do give rise to is really significant. So I think, um, it's important that you can hear from the board members to understand that their considerations um, might are being taken into account. Um, maybe to continue on for this, um, thanks Pippa for that. And I think with partnerships and um, with the longer lead time that's needed, I think if there's an explanation that goes into that as part of a, that risk management process, then the art form boards are totally considering that, um, which would then lead to the next question of, um, rather than looking at the measurement of outcomes, but maybe what um, would you see as common outcomes for development projects, not necessarily presentation, but projects that might be in development. Um, Mona, I might start with you. Ah, oh, projects in development. Um, I suppose I'd be looking for, um, you know, a clear articulation of what the uh, potential outcome of a development stage could be um, for an artist or a group that's working with a creative um, and um, what other stakeholders have interest in in the, the looking at the outcome of a development project with ideally the intention of um, you know having some sort of involvement in the next stage or the presentation stage um, and seeing that really 
kind of clearly articulated. I'd be interested in the um, the, uh, the the kind of um, the 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 level of experience the artist currently um, has and where they see themselves heading um, and what resources and tools are going to be made available through um, the project um, to to support their their creative journey. I think those would be. Um, yeah, the, those kind of aspects for me would be really important to 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 have been to be clear in the application, um, as well as all the you know the the kind of levels of partnership, mentorship if there is a mentorship um, part of attached as part of the project, um, and yeah, I think that's that's it for me. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with everything you said then, and I think the, the only thing that I would add is that I'm, I really encourage that sort of creative development and, and in, in applications because I think that often we don't give ourselves the time or the, or the I, mean, I, was, I was about to say luxury, and it's not a luxury, it's actually really a central part of, you know, a project development. So it's, um, I, I guess I'd say, don't be frightened to, um, make your project about creative development and as Mona said like you can still have a clear vision for what you want to achieve with that and a, a clear outline of who the kind of creative stakeholders are in that process and and where you want to get to but it doesn't necessarily have to have a kind of you know a, a, a public performance or a public outcome um, in and of itself I think creative development is a really essential part of you know developing our creative landscape. Ah, great. It my go to froze for a moment. So <laughs> apologies. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Mona. Um, I think that absolutely is when you're looking at the development, it is, as you both have said, it's so important to be able to um, articulate those processes. Um, one of the other questions that we've had that's come through our online registration is around um, how do, this is from you as well, Piva, how do diverse and young artists with a little track record get privileged in this, in this grant system? Um, how can artists who don't have um, that extensive track record, who come from um, diverse backgrounds, uh, maybe emerging, what could they do to be able to engage with the grants process and create and also to write the most successful application. Mona, I might start with you. Uh, a few things from me. I, I think start small, um, so apply for a small grant. There are, we, we have the quick response, so Create offers the $5,000 project grant just to kind of kickstart a project. Um, for um, Look, I think for, for young and emerging and diverse artists, I think we're like the me personally, but also I think the rest of the board um, really uh, enjoys kind of reading applications and you know proposals from artists that we've you know don't have uh, you know a lot of experience or up and coming, um, and so I I you know I think that we want to see more of that. We want to see more young and diverse and emerging practitioners um, come through. Um, I think one of the things that you could, a, a, a person can do, an artist can do who's emerging could also um, build a bit of a network, um, connect with people who are, ex who have more experience, who can maybe offer some mentoring. Um, also, I think what would be a value is a collaboration between an emerging and an established artist, um, because the you know I think and and also being able to articulate how that how that um, collaboration will kind of um, you know contribute to the the creative journey of the emerging artist and practitioner. Um, yeah, I think those those elements are really important. Um, but definitely, I just want to kind of reiterate the uh, you know the value of um, seeing more and more emerging 
practitioners come through and apply, start to apply from, you know, with a small grant and then kind of come back and apply for the 20,000 and then the 50 and continue on. Peter? Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, also would mention that um, Create New South Wales does have priority areas that um, is often a, a lens that we, we, we look at things through as well. Um, and as Mona said, when when we meet as a board, we, we're very keen to, to see applications coming from those areas that are not strongly represented um, traditionally. And in fact, you know, if we if we do see gaps, there's an opportunity for us as a board at the end of our assessment process to identify that, which goes into meeting notes and then gets um, 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 moved into um, kind of, you know, the Create New South Wales area where they can discuss the the, um, the, the makeup of the applications we've received in that round. So if we're seeing some gaps there, there's opportunities to talk about that. But I'd also reiterate what Mona said about starting small as well. And with my sort of regional kind of hat on, there are a number of um, small grant opportunities in, in regional New South Wales, things like CASP, which actually is open now, um, Country Art Support Program, which can lead to um, you know, RAP pro projects, which kind of like is a stepping stone into, into larger projects as well. So I think that's really strong advice. And, and again, in a regional context, the regional arts development organisations, of which you know, I had one up here in the Northern Rivers, were available to talk through that process as well. So there are other ways of getting information and support as a, as a young or emerging or diverse um, applicant um, um, outside of just, you know, the, the Create New South Wales grant program. Thanks, Mona. Thanks, Peter. Um, I think those pathways are really important and it's so great to hear both of you um, be able to talk through that and that you both recognise the significance of um, ensuring that there is a diversity um, in ages cultures, everything. Um, we have a question online um, and I think this is probably partly to be answered by um, you both and partly to be answered as some of the logistics from CREATE. Um, Anna says, I'm applying for a project that is part music recording and part audio storing editing. Um, it's on its way to being completed, um, so it's part of a larger project, but that not what's being um, applied for. Um, it's not presentation. It's not really development. It's more a production phase. Um, and the question is, how should I rate this as a development or as a presentation, as it won't have an audience outcome at the end of the project? So I've been calling a development. And then do you think this is the right fit? Um, I think in terms of the elig around the eligibility side from CREATE, uh, I think a development would be the right fit because this is part of the production. Um, but I'd be interested to see, um, Mona and Peter, how um, you would see the production phase fitting. Um, and this is very much as assessors, um, not around eligibility that I'm asking. Um, from an eligibility perspective, it would be as a development phase. So maybe Peter, I'll start um, with you in how, what questions would you be asking um, if this was a development or what would you be looking for um, in an application around this? Um, yeah, I think maybe going back to an earlier conversation we had about um, still wanting to see some clear goals for that, like a vision for that. So I still want to understand what the development process is geared towards. Um, and I completely appreciate that it doesn't necessarily have to have a production or an outcome component to it at this stage, but if you're actually applying for a development process, then I still want to see how it's addressing those criteria areas of mirror impact and viability. They still apply. And I think it's really important that you use those as an opportunity to really articulate 
what the what the development is actually going to give what's it going to change like you know what will this process change for you as a as a as a creative um what will um, and how will that change be measured as well and again not necessarily i'm, I'm not necessarily saying it has to um, be measured in terms of a, a you know a production or a performance outcome but how do you measure those steps in that development process to show that you know you and the project are on the right path so i'm still looking for you know clear vision and clear intent, I guess, with what you want to achieve with it. Hola. Yeah, I think I just have one thing to add to that. And it's just, I suppose, and it fits into the vision and the clear path where it's heading. Um, but also I, I would be, even though, even if you applied for it as a development, um, I would be really interested in knowing who it's for, who is, you know, who who, who the intended audience is, um, and and what you what the next stage looks like for you. Absolutely, and I think that um, goes back to that idea of audience. Um, an audience reach and being quite specific on um, who you would be looking even into the future to engage with um, or not. I think also that question around development or presentation might lead into the next question which is about um, what is your experience each of multi-arts and um, what do you consider uh, to be a multi-arts project and given the fields that you both have worked in across art forms, um, what do you think is the unique um, context with which multi-arts works um, in the arts, the New South Wales arts and cultural sector? Um, Mona, I might start with you. The hard one. Um, always interesting when you you know that look I think multiple art forms with no dominant form I suppose for me is uh, um, where I can easily say yep yeah, this definitely fits this is multi art form um, you know and I can uh, um, if I can give an example if it's okay I can give an example of a, of a project that um, isn't multi art form for example a theatre production and then using projections being considered as multi-art form when the dominant kind of form is, is theatre. Um, so yeah, I think it's just kind of genuinely multiple art forms being used across a project, within a project with artists who are, um, who practice the multiple art forms. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question and is useful. Thanks, Mona. Peter, would you like um, to add something? Yeah, just that um, I think I, I work a lot with multi arts projects. Um, just the nature of working in in, in um, the region that I work in, and the kind of focus that we have as a as an arts organisation, which is very much about cultural development in our regional communities. So often we apply a multi arts approach to everything to, to most things that we do. Um, and I think that one thing that I look for is making sure that there's still a kind of defining goal within that project or within that activity. Um, even though you're bringing together a, quite a number and, and diverse, you know, art forms to, to achieve that goal, that it's all actually like, you know, um, you know, like, tuning an orchestra to make sure it's all working towards you know the, the the outcome and so the very nature of the the multi-arts aspect is delivering that and that's when i get excited by multi-arts projects because you can see where it's headed where it's where it's going but it's going it, to its journey is informed by such diverse kind of you know art forms and, and artists and creatives that are all you know on board um that that process Thanks, Peter. That's great. Um, so the next question then, given the multi-art form um, topic, is how would you define the difference between a screen-based artist and a filmmaker, specifically in relation to installations? Um, and Peter, I might start with you. Um, 
Sure. I think maybe for, for an example, like we, we one of the multi arts projects that we worked on had a filmmaker um, or a screen um, artist who was part of the project. Um, and we um, engaged him to work with a local community in a, a, a remote area um, to work with the community um, to create a, a response to a, a cultural asset there, which was a community hall. And so um, as, a, as a screen artist, he used film and um, but then used um, live music with it. He used um, um, uh, a performance element to it as well. So it became a, um, a, a sort of multi-arts screen focused project it, 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 and I wouldn't call that just a not just but I wouldn't call that a, a filmmaker um, um, project as such because it had so many different um, aspects to it and angles to it that, that made that project happen but screen was still very much you know sat there as a as the kind of driving force behind it um, I'm not sure that answered it actually <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Mona um, the same question for you. What is the difference between film, also given your experience on the Arab Film Festival, and a screen artist who might be working um, in film or in that area? Okay, I'll do my best. Um, I suppose I see film as very traditional film, kind of, you know, whether it's a short, a documentary, or a, a series online. Um, I think the easiest way to kind of get clarification on whether your project is, um, you know, feel, uh, as fits within kind of whether you should apply for, for this round or to Screen New South Wales is to have a look at Screen New South Wales, um, you know, go to the website, check out what funding is available through them. And hopefully that helps when you look at the criteria. Um, but yeah, I, I, I suppose what Peter already said. I think it's um, it'll be. I, I could. I see a lot of projects come through that have a screen component, um, or is um, presented on screen. So it doesn't. You know, to me, that's not a traditional film, um, and it could be a series of shorts um, or a, a you know experimental kind of works presented on screen and engaging audiences in a different way, or maybe it's one, um, you know, screen is utilised, like the example I gave earlier about the kind of, uh, you know, a, a theatrical project or, you know, performers on stage interacting with screen, um, screen work, projections. Not straightforward, is it? <laughs> It's not a. It's not straightforward um, because I do think that there are a lot of contemporary artists who work um, in screen and in. I just said screen, not screen. In screen and in film, and I do think it is about looking at where the intersections are. But I think Mona, with your comments earlier, it was fantastic in saying it's not about having a dominant art form, it is about the multiple art forms. So if you are looking at applying in this round, screen absolutely can be one component or one area of um, the application, but making sure that there's no predominant one um, that overtakes across the art forms. We hope that was helpful for everyone. Um, I think my last um, kind of wrapping up questions, um, and I might start with you, Peter, is actually three um, of the thing, if you could identify three of your top tips for um, grant applications and what you really think um, is really helpful for people to include in them. Um, so I might throw to you now. Sure. Um, I think going back to where I started with just a really clear statement of your vision for the project so that it's really understandable and really digestible straight away so that you get it straight away. I, that's, to be honest, there's been some applications where I've struggled to actually understand what the goal is and, and what wants to be achieved. Um, and those applications that come through that can clearly state that at the, at the very front um, 
kind of make it relaxes me <laughs> in a way that I can actually relax into the application and, and understand it. So, um, yeah, so I think if you've got that clarity about your vision, about what you want and, and finding a way to communicate that, and I always um, give this feedback to, to people who approach us for grant writing and, and grant um, submission um, tips. It's, it's about, you know, um, trying it out against other people too, people who don't know you or the project and, and explain what you want to do to them before you hit the send button on your application to make sure that it is really clear that, you know, people are understanding what, what you want to achieve. Um, and I guess the other thing is um, I kind of find the impact of the project really important and a really important thing for applicants to to convince me of as well. And that impact is about um, what will be changed in this process. Um, because we get a lot of applications that have a have some similarity to them in terms of where they've come from and what they want to achieve and those sorts of things. And what can separate them is really about that impact. And, and to my mind, it's about if, if this project is funded, what will it change? What, what, um, how will it improve? How will it, how will it benefit the, the, the target audience or community that it's going for? So thinking really deeply about the impact that you that you want to achieve with your project, I think is, is really important. And the other thing I think is, is just being really kind of, um, um, strategic about the support material that you provide. I think using, um, putting a really kind of, you know, clear lens over that in terms of what do you want that support material to tell us about you, to tell us about the project or to tell us about the audience or the community or the partners that you're bringing to that project as well. Um, I think as Brianna mentioned earlier that, you know, there's a lot of material that we, we go through um, that is presented as part of an application. And so um, if you're using that as an opportunity to tell the story of your application in a really clear way, that's, that's going to help a lot. Um, and so again, run it past people, I, I would say all the time, making sure that they're understanding what you're trying to achieve. They're my three tips. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Mona, what would be your top three? Um, uh, everything Peter said, um, but also uh, just, I suppose, a really concise kind of description of who you are, whether you're an individual or a group or an organisation, um, who you are, what you do and why you do it. Um, because often, you know, we like some of the panel members, board members uh, don't know every organisation that applies or don't know a lot about the artists who apply. And I think that's, um, you know, a kind of, you know, one paragraph of who you are, what you do and why you do it um, would be a great introduction. Um, support material, what Peter already said, but also just something, it, support material that's genuine um, and that, you know, is clearly articulates um, why that particular stakeholder or participant is in support of this project and urges us to fund it. Why should we fund it? I think that's really important. Sometimes, um, believe it or not, there are support letters that look like they've been written by the same person and they're copied and pasted. And I think that's a real, it, that's a real shame because, you know, often the project sounds interesting, but it's not backed by support material. Um, uh, backing up what you say the impact is going to be with evidence. And again, that can be done with support material. Um, and one other thing, I was just going to say something about innovation um, or kind of, you know, a clear vision of the project. But sometimes uh, um, in a description of a project, it's stated that the project is innovative, but it, I'd like to see um, that explained a little bit more because what could be innovative in Campbelltown may not be innovative in, I don't know, Bankstown, for example. Um, and so, you know, where projects are being held and who they're being, who they're engaging with, whether it's the artist, the organisation, the partners or the community, I think um, that, that a, a kind of a little bit more detail around why this project is important and why it's um, groundbreaking, if it's groundbreaking or unique in that particular part of the community. Um, would be really useful and um, kind of, you know, support the application. 
I think that, thank you, Mona, that's excellent. And I think raising that question around innovation and what that means and really explaining why the project is innovative to a community or to an area um, is really significant. And I think that's hopefully very uh, helpful for everyone that's here today. Um, I just wanted to say if there are any questions that you feel like um, we haven't answered or that you might have before 5 p.m. tomorrow, um, please feel free to get in contact with Create New South Wales. Um, all of our details are up there now. And before you all go, I just want to say thank you so much to Munazela and Peter Wood for really sharing your knowledge. And I hope that it's created um, an insight for everyone into what the art form boards are looking for, um, but also now to be able to put faces and ideas um, to names can often help in overcoming some of the um, anxiety around applications as well. So if we were in a room together, I'd be like, great, thank you, Mona and Peter. So. We now just have to do it online. So thank you both very much for your generosity of knowledge and time today. And thank you everyone else for attending and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.